Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. We should be good? Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, I am Karina Stipp. I'm a realtor and I specialize in uh, helping seniors. Um, our specialist, as I mentioned, um, had a very last minute cancellation. So uh, Richard Miller um, is our, was, was to be our panelist and we're gonna talk about what he does and what people in his industry do. Um, the reason I chose to specialize in helping seniors really goes back to um, the process of helping my mother. My dad died when he was 55, I was in my 20s. And um, so my mom lived on for another 30 years and just passed last year at 81. And um, so about 15 years ago, she still lived on the farm where I grew up. And we had this conversation, you know, mom, it's, you know, two acres to mow and it, she had 40 acres out in the country and was there by herself for a long time. And my brother and I kept kind of urging her to move somewhere that was easier. And so she finally, her comment to me was, yeah, but there's all this stuff. <laughs> and at that time I was with a company I had five weeks of vacation I'd been with that company a long time I had a company car and I said if you want me to do this this is your choice I will spend all my vacation this year and I lived in Florida at the time and I would drive back and forth in the company car because it was free and um, and I would help her for a week at a time and this took the whole summer that's what I did and it was brutal I didn't know that there were people who helped with that, really. I knew there were movers, obviously. But the whole pack, purge, donate, we were in the, in the country, so I burned. <laughs> I had a burn pile going a lot. There, that whole process was brutal. And I remember thinking, it's gotta, there's got to be a better way. And so I literally had her ready. And she didn't make the decision for a couple of years to, to move. When she made the decision, she had been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And she had both houses under contract at that time. So by then I'd started a new job and I flew in and spent a four day weekend. And to me it was life or death. We had to get this done. And part of the reason why was she'd been put on a medicine, it didn't work. They took her off of it, did nothing. These were local doctors, small community. And I was determined we were gonna get her to a better hospital. So MD Anderson was willing to take her, but they were three weeks out on appointments and she wouldn't make the appointment. And I finally said to her, why are you not doing this? We, this is urgent. Well, I've got to get moved, Karina. I said, mom, it doesn't matter where you live if you're dead. <laughs> We've got to get this done. So every box that I'd pre-packed, every one I hauled down those stairs, I would thank myself. Thank God I did this already. Thank God I did this. And my brother was resistant. He didn't think she'd ever make the move. And so he was not much help in the beginning, those five weeks that I spent that summer. Um, he finally did pitch in and brought his kids and all of that, but, um, but it, was, it was a long process. And so having gone through all of that, um, as I be, made the decision to become a realtor several years ago now, I thought, you know, there's a way to help people, not just with a move, not just the simple transaction, but the whole big picture. And so um, as I started kind of diving down that rabbit hole, um, I learned about move managers and that's what Richard does and unfortunately not here today, but um, I honestly would call him more than a move manager. He and other people like him in his industry are magicians, truly. <laughs> like, so one of the things move managers can do, has anybody ever used a move manager? No. So movers do, you know, moving and packing, right? It's okay, come on in. But move managers literally will come into your home and that you can do this a la carte or you can do the whole shebang. So they're going to take a look at every square inch of your home and all the sheds and anything, that the attic, all of it. And then they will price different components and then give you the total for what it will take to disperse your, li liquidate your estate. So. That may be from you choosing to move into a senior community that has a 600 square foot apartment, studio apartment. It could be just moving from a 4,000 square foot house where you've raised your kids and it has all stairs and all the bathrooms and bedrooms are up and you're getting tired, right? And you wanna move into a 55 community that's all one floor. So they can do any of that. And part of what they'll do is they'll help you shred all the old documents. They'll help you with 
um, the estate the, the estate salespeople. They'll help you with um, any of the donations. If there's anything that your kids live out of state and it needs to be shipped to them, they handle all of that. And you literally just make decisions. You don't have to touch anything. They handle it all for you, which is a safety matter, really, if you think about it. Because your brain says, oh, I moved here. It's only been 15 years ago. I can handle it. But your body says something different. And the truth is, if you fall while you're trying to move that box, the hospital bill alone and the copay and the time and the, you know, all of that, you would have been better off to hire someone. So if you're, let's say you're moving into a senior community, into that apartment, this move managers will literally, the morning you wake up, everything that's on your nightstand that you use every night, you're going to wake up and go to a movie and have lunch with friends. And when you move into your new place, all the pictures are on the wall. The things that were on your nightstand that morning, they're on the new nightstand. The coffee's made in the coffee maker and everything's in its place. It's all taken care of for you. That's what's so cool about, that's why I call him a magician because how wonderful is that, right? So that's what Richard does um, and his company is called Smooth Transitions and he, there's some folders up here if you all want those. When you leave, just pick one up. Um, and he's local, yeah. How does he get paid? Um, so uh, you would pay him based upon, uh oh, percentage? yeah, I don't know where it went. Um, it's, so if you figure percentage, it's going to range anywhere from, I would say three to 6% um, of whatever the sale your home would be. So if you can kind of rough, that's a real rough estimate. And some of this has to do with, he will charge extra if a room is packed pretty solid, for instance, versus just kind of normal contents. You said percent of the home. Is that percent in contents like what the estate sellers would sell? So let's say that your house is going to sell for $600,000 um, and you have it just kind of normal belongings. You don't, you're not a hoarder. You don't have extra clothes stacked anywhere. There's not boxes. Any, you, know, you really only have two or three bins of Christmas in the attic, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you're probably at 4 or 5%. So then you can multiply that times the 600000 mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're at 4%, then it's going to cost you 20 some thousand. And that's, again, that's a very rough, that's, let's say that house is 3,000 square feet. Okay. That's, that's a very rough estimate. So is it cheap? No. Is it necessary? Maybe. Depends on your situation. Um, so options are to do all the work yourself, right? Um, and that may be manageable. You know, that's, um, I know we were talking, tell me your name again. Back here in the back. Uh-huh. Ron. Huh? Ron. Ron. So Ron moved here from Louisiana, and he's in a 55-plus community. So he's already done the, one of the big downsizings, right, several years back. And so doing all the work yourself, maybe that's doable. I don't know. Um, depends on where you're moving to. And, and when I say all the work, is that packing, and then you still have movers come in, probably. You know, maybe you have a bunch of kids that live nearby and they're all real helpful and they have kids and you just kind of have them all come in like a, you know, paratroopers and they move everything out on a weekend. Some families will do that. Um, most of the time they're pretty busy and it's tough to get them all rounded up. Um, you can utilize a move management company. Um, you can have an estate sale, auction, garage sale, and we're going to talk about that a little more in a little bit. Um, you can donate. And then you can also enlist family, friends, and nonprofit agencies. Um, and some of those things are easier said than done. Let's say a nonprofit agency. Some of them have really strict um, rules about what they'll do. They won't do anything from an upper level, for instance. So they will come pick up anything that you want to donate, but they won't move it downstairs. So you have to ask those questions when you call. It sounds like, you, oh, they'd be happy to have it. They may not have the manpower. They may not want it. So it, it, there's a lot of those kinds of things um, that come into play. So um, before I get to that page, let me, the handout that you have, there's a two page handout, here it is, that says clean out treasures. So this is something Richard sent to me yesterday. He was gonna bring this. Um, and this is just some tips on what to look for as you go through your belongings. So if you decide to do some of the work yourself and kind of start paring down 
belongings. Hey, Sandy. Um, if you would sign in here, and then I'm going to give you this. Okay. Um, look for some of these things are valuable. So that's one of the things that you know people may not realize are. Um, but some of the things you think are valuable may not have much value. And that has to do with the fact that this market um, is growing every single day, the senior market. So today we have 55 million people in the U.S. that are over 65. In the next 20 years, that will grow to 90 million. And that means all of those people and their belongings are going to start coming down this funnel into the market. And it already started happening. Your kids and your grandkids don't want your china. They don't want your furniture. They don't want your silver, right? <laughs> they want to travel to Guam <laughs> or Argentina. Um, they want experiences, and, um, and it's a whole different mindset with this new generation. So um, the things that you unfortunately had on, you know, layaway or were on your shower list um, or your registry, unfortunately, just may not have much value. Now, it's worth having that conversation with your kids um, and grandkids just to see if they have any interest. Um, but if they don't, just know that that's, it's, it's not even easy for the estate sale people to move, okay? And so that's why, the, don't chuck anything until you have a conversation if you are going to talk to an estate sale company because um, some of the things you think might need to be thrown away or donated may have a ton of value. That may have the market may have changed. And the things that you think are, you know, the other direction, no, no value at all. So it's, it's changed a lot, um, may not be what you think it is, and it's important to have those conversations and not make snap judgments. It's, um, one of the things that I brought today was this guy. <clears throat> and um, this was my dad's teddy bear. And my dad, I mentioned earlier, he died over 30 years ago. Um, he was a really good guy. I had, I was, my brother and I both won the lottery with our parents. And um, I still remember the day my dad came into my room when I was little and I hadn't realized it was just in with my stuffed animals. And my dad said, oh, that was my teddy bear. And so he's lived in every house with me since. And so if I were to have move managers or kids or whoever it is, volunteers, come into my house and start helping me move, he would be probably in the line of fire, right? <laughs> he would be probably one of the first things they go, oh, that guy needs to, you know, right over here in the hefty bag. And, and so, the reason I brought him, and, the, and I actually made a post on Facebook about him recently because I've had conversations um, in the last several weeks with some clients whose kids have gotten involved and feelings have gotten hurt. And so I think it's very important, especially when it comes to your kids. The, the kids are um, likely in what's called, I don't know why that's flashing, but we'll ignore it, <laughs> the screen. Um, the kids are likely in the sandwich generation is kind of what we're termed, and that's I'm one of them. So I have a family, I have a career, and now my parents are gone, but I was in the middle of taking care of my mother last year, and that's part of that. And so there's a lot of pressure, right, on the sandwich generation. Take care of your parents, take care of your family, take care of your career, and you have this much time to do it. So they have a tendency, some of them, to come in and make really fast decisions and talk over parents in some cases. And so it's really important for you to have conversations while you're healthy, while your mind is healthy, while you're feeling strong about things, and say to your kids, I have boundaries. I need you to respect them. And here they are. And your boundaries may be different, Carol, than your boundaries, Miranda, right, or yours, Sandy. So having those boundaries set in place will help avoid some of those emotional conversations that can get kind of ugly. Because the last thing you need is all of your help stomping off and going to Chili's to have lunch. <laughs> 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 when, when really you need them there all day that whole weekend to get things done, right? And so part of, I think, that conversation needs to happen, not only to set the boundaries, but to also say, there's a story behind this. There's a story that goes with this, and this is why this thing is important to me. So I think it's important, as you have time and the chance, to identify the non-negotiables for you. You know, for me, the teddy bear is one of them, right? And it'll be different for you. 
But whatever the non-negotiables are, if, especially if you're doing the work yourself to downsize, you make sure that you have those protected in, in you know, whether it's a tag that you put on there or a special box or whatever it is, a closet, and you say, that's mine. And there's some things that kids are going to come to and probably just automatically respect, right? They're going to respect things like jewelry and, and photos because those kind of automatically. But there's other things like this that will go by the wayside very quickly. Um, and it needs to, the conversation needs to happen not only for you and for your health, mental health, but also so that that, because somebody in your family may want the teddy bear later and pass it along, right? And so that story remains in your family and continues. So um, when should seniors consider move managers? Well, I think, I think it's worth having a conversation with a move manager just to see. They, I mean, they're going to give you a free quote. So it doesn't hurt to ask. And sometimes there are, when they give you the quote and you see the big number and you think, oh, I don't know if I can afford to pay all of that, I might be able to do this and this and this. And then it cuts it down by, you know, a half, right? Um, so document, shredding the documents. Well, can you sit there and do that while you watch TV? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> right? Um, we talked a little bit about what move managers do and their fees. And their fees cover, you know, anything from soup to nuts. They really are, um, they pride themselves, that whole industry, on being the ones to provide the answers that you need and doing everything they can to keep you safe in the process. And most of the time, most of the time, I think it's best if you move your belongings out of your, if you have a house to sell um, as a senior, I think it's best for you to move them out first, move into your new place, and then a lot of move managers will use the term shop the house. So you go into your new environment and you're there for a week or two weeks and you figure out the things that you, oh, I didn't bring this. And you can go back to your house and you get those things. And then you don't have that regret. Now you need to have a hard stop or you're gonna continue to shop your house until the point that you're looking like a hoarder in your new community. But <laughs> you set yourself those parameters and give yourself that room to go back. And then you're in your new place the move managers move the rest of the things out, the house is empty, and now it's sold. And, and part of the safety thing there is, unfortunately, um, there are bad people out there in the world. Um, they see a house for sale, they see the belongings, they might think, oh, somebody older lives there. I want, you know, I want to go over there and see if I can't take advantage of them. And there are stories of seniors who are under contract. They're gonna, they're gonna close in two weeks and somebody comes up and sells them leaf guards for their gutters because that's gonna add value to the house. Well, no, it's not. If you're under contract, <laughs> you don't need to do that. To, you know, somebody already wants to buy it for the price as is. So those are some things that can happen. They can break in. There's, there's just, you're moving things around. You can trip over things because you're not used to it. You've lived there forever. So it, there's just a lot of good reasons to move the things out first and sell the house after, if you're able to. Okay. Um, is an estate sale right for you? Has anyone done an, an estate sale before? I'm yeah, me too, right? Um, so estate sales have a, a lot of the companies here in town have different rules. Um, some of them will not even um, offer to, to offer their services to you unless they can net at least $10,000. So part of what you need to kind of assess is, do you have the kind of belongings in your home that are going to bring that kind of money. And if they're netting that amount, they're probably going to keep 40% of whatever comes in. 40, 50% is usually the, the cut. Yeah, right. Um, so you have to kind of determine those kind of things. There's a lot of different companies you can shop around. If you work with a move manager, they will help you with that. They have the right ones to bring in. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, you'll, you'll need to make a number of phone calls and determine you know, who's the right one for me and will they take you on. Okay, um, and what are options if an estate sale isn't a good fit? So let's, I've had, you know, I had a pair of teachers I had um, a conversation with and, you know, they've lived there for a long time and raised their kids, but their belongings weren't necessarily anything estate sale worthy. Um, 
And so we talked about you know, what their options were. And so one of those is to have a, you know, a garage sale where people come in and they just you know, buy it right out of the house. Um, you want to be careful that you have either somebody there that you've hired to help move things out so they're not bungling up your house, right? Because you've got otherwise amateurs that are moving things in and out of doors and so forth. So you don't want people dropping things or liability. Um, you can do some Craigslist and that kind of thing. There's a lot of scammers out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I think, um, does anybody use the Nextdoor app? I think it's a little better um, than Craigslist. You have, no, you've had some scammers on there too. No, not scammers. It just um, doesn't have the um, audience. It does not have the audience. <laughs> you're right. Um, it, you're, it, that is correct. It doesn't have the audience. If it's something that one of your neighbors could use, it, it's the, the net is only cast so far because it only it's next door for a reason, right? Um, but there are some of those kinds of options, um, and then donating is one of the other options. What's that? Options. options? Yeah. What are some of the options? Oh, an auctioneer. Right. And so there are auction houses. Um, some of them will come in and give you a bid and they'll take it to their auction house and they do the auction there. So um, Hoy here in Wake Forest is one of those um, that will either come to you or, huh? Yeah, some of them get really full and they'll be six months out before they can get to you. So that's the other thing that people are surprised about. They think, oh, I can just call them and they'll come right over. But they're, they literally have a backlog. And that's, again, going to get worse as time goes on because we'll have more seniors flooding the market that are going to want to dis, you know, liquidate their estates. So you can call and have those conversations. Um, the season in the spring and summer is the heaviest for all of us, whether it's real estate or um, auctioneers, what have you, estate people. And so you have to be booked way in advance. Okay, this time of year is a little easier. Not as many houses on the market, although right now there's more, but yeah. Excuse me. Uh-huh. Oh, you about that. Okay. Okay. So um, selling items on um, consignment. There's some places, you know, around you can call consignment stores and they, they can sell it. Usually they'll keep, you know, again, it's a good portion of it, um, a percentage. Um, and so if you have a specific, like an antique secretary and the rest of the stuff is really more garage sale worthy, maybe you have the one thing that goes on consignment. I would take pictures and measurements, um, talk to some consignment stores and see if there's some that you could either email that to or if they have a cell phone, you can just send that to and see if they have an interest in it. Is there a consignment shop that specializes in like antique uh, china? You know, the famous china <laughs> I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm sure Richard probably would be the one more. That's something that I don't get into as much. Um, I would say that if you take Richard's information, he'll be able to, you know, guide you in the right way if you want one of his flyers. Um, I know Replacements Limited, you know, which is up in. Uh, Burlington. Yeah. yeah, you have to ship everything to them, is what well, I've heard. You could, you could even drive there, but um, they give you nothing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they charge quite a bit because right. that's that they they have the the market then, on anybody who actually wants that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't want to pay anything because they're. I've tried them before with some old stuff, and yeah. they're like, "We'll give you a couple dollars." I'm like, "Well, if you Google it, it's worth." Uh, they don't care. They don't care, yeah, because that's it's either us or you can do it yourself. It's one of those things. I have to look at myself up because I get um, auction places on my cell phone. They sell a lot of antiques. They do. Yeah, they, do you get that? I have. There's a statesales.net and um, Black Rock Galleries is another one. They're both online. Mine are with ones that used to be local and. They're not, um, I don't think they're local. You can, estatesales.net does have the local, and if you put in your zip code, you can see all the different companies. So I would go there um, if you're wanting to find, you know, someone to talk to, and then just start going through the, essentially that list and making phone calls to see, you know, who would even take a look at your belongings. Yeah, Kara? I think going to estate sales, not because you want to find more stuff, but just <laughs> to see what things are going for. Right. Might as well.
Them. Yeah, Blue Moon is one, um, and you'll see them have local, yeah, and uh, Magnolia is another. Um, but they, they both have pretty high minimums. Um, I think Blue Moons is, and I'm, this is from memory, I'm not sure, but I think Blue Moons is 10,000 10, in net, and I think Magnolia's is 20 that they have to net. So you, you have to have like, you know, art and so forth. And art is another thing. So obviously very subjective. Um, that's Richard probably would have talked about this. He, did, he brought it up and he said, make sure that it has a certificate of authenticity on the back. If it doesn't, it's probably not worth much. However, if you really feel it is, then have, you know, you could contact him and he'll give you some, they've got people that can look at those things. Also, if it's signed. Signed. Yeah. 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 To look at, um, like a lot of, <clears throat> it, I'm go, I've been to thousands of antique things here in Virginia. And a lot of your bases and stuff that you may not think are worthwhile. If you look on the bottom of it, there are different signs that tell you. That's right. If it's um, worth anything, and if it's signed, um, the signature may be just like a little. You may want water. A little blurb or something, and or just like a mark, and. Um, a lot of times it's, I mean, they're worth a lot of money. Yeah. I think anytime you can find the mark, you know, I would, the first thing I would do is Google it and see if you can find any more information about it. Um, and then, you know, talk to people in the industry and see if they would value it. Um, and sometimes you have certain runs or years that are worth a lot more than others. Some of that seems really random and it has to do with demand, you know, it's, yeah, supply and demand. Um, suggestions for donating items. Well, we talked about that a little bit, but you know, call different nonprofits. Restore is one. Helping Hands is another. Um, Green, chair. Green, chair. Green Chair is another. That's right. Um, so ask what their requirements are. Ask how far out they are. Again, this is a planning thing, and some of them can't get to you for three or four weeks or longer. Um, so you have to be able to. Um, Factor that, that time frame in. If you've you know looked online and found the dream house, or you toured a senior community with a friend and decided that's for me, you know if you want to do that in a fairly short period of time, then you may need to hire some people and pay a little extra money to get that done because they're going to make get it done for you. They will have the phone numbers and they will fit in favors and so forth um, that you won't be able to call in. <laughs> Now, if you're thinking, oh, I'd like to go into a senior community um, at some point down the road, um, and by senior community, I mean independent living or a CCRC or one of the ones that we've talked a little bit about before. Um, if you're looking to go into some of those, the wait list can be short or long depending on what type of unit you're looking at. So the smaller the unit, usually the less the wait time, especially for studio apartments. But if you're looking at villas or houses, which some of the CCRCs have, the wait list can be as long as seven to 10 years. Cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if that's something you think you might want to do, again, this, we were talking about planning before the, the, this session started, right? So you really do have to plan way ahead because you can go, I could go get my name on one of those lists now. I just put a little deposit down, right? And then they'll call me every time one of those units comes up. It'll probably be a while before I hear from them if I want the one that's seven to 10 years out. And then let's say I'm really not ready for 20 years. Well, the good news is I'm right at the top of the list by the time I'm ready. I can tell them to pass me every single time they call me until I'm ready. And so that's one of the things where if you plan and you have the place picked out and you know you're not ready now, this is when you go do that. This is when you decide. Because if you don't, it's not available, I guarantee you. The plum places, all taken. And they're filled up almost as soon as they open up. Glen Eyre just opened a whole new wing, or they're opening it, I think, next month. It's already all full. Cardinal downtown in North Hills, right? The Cardinal had a whole new wing they opened this year. It was concierge. And it's about 750000 to get in. And then you pay rent. And the rent there starts around the 7000 mark for a really small unit and goes up from there. That's per month. So, and imagine it was full before it opened, isn't that? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. If that's something you desire, plan, or it's gone because somebody else will be in line in front of you. Um, 
what items sell best and what doesn't sell, that's you know, subjective. Um, that has to do, I think the, the cheat sheet that Richard provided is probably one of the best things. Um, we've already talked about silver and, and uh, China not being popular, right? Um, ask, huh? And crystal. Crystal, same thing. Yeah, yeah, Waterford even, you know, it's, it just goes for almost nothing. And my mom had a couple Waterford pieces. I just sold them on an online site and, you know, I kept lowering the price. They finally sold for a little nothing. Made a few bucks. And I purposely pulled those things out thinking they might sell for just a little more. They probably did than the auction, but not much. And the auction, she had a lot of stuff. She, her auction was, um, I think that this is in the Midwest, so it's different. Her auctioneer took 30% and we, we netted, this is with an antique car. She had an, a 49 Oldsmobile. <laughs> so with the car, all of her belongings, and she had a lot, um, I think we netted seventeen thousand dollars with the car. And then they took thirty percent of that. But the thirty percent was after they took their part, so it was what twenty. Yeah. Uh huh. I think the car he, my brother did some of that because I, I got the house to the finish line. Where, you know, I worked like crazy and got the house ready, and then I said to my brother, "You're going to have to drag this across the finish line." I went back and worked one more week in November, and then he did the auction in like January. And, and it was probably not the best month, but we just wanted to be, we didn't think holding on to it was gonna, you know. She had some separate buildings that my brother owned. She left those to him. So we had the luxury of moving everything over to those buildings and doing the auction after the fact. We really weren't under the gun, which was a gift to us. It was, it was really the best, very best situation we could have had. So um, should you get a head start? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Um, now. Right. Um, where to start? Well, and, and an attic might, might not be the place if it's not a safe place. So if you have a walk-in attic and you feel safe going into your attic, um, you know, or if you feel like now you can still get that done, do, that, do those things now. Um, you know, if you're pulling the Christmas things out to put up for Christmas or the ho whatever holiday it is you, you, know, you have, Hanukkah, whatever, downsize all of that when you put it away this year. You know, it's a perfect time to do that. And um, do a drawer at night. So you're sitting down, right, and you're watching your favorite show. Pull one of the drawers out of the kitchen, the junk drawer. Everybody have a junk drawer in their kitchen? Pretty much, right? <laughs> so pull your, your junk drawer and put it on a TV tray in front of you and just go through that. Because all of those little things will add up in the end. It'll make things a lot easier. And if you've already downsized that and the things that you kept in the drawer you want, it'll just go into a box that goes to your next place for the junk drawer at the new place because you'll probably have one there. Um, what happens to things left over after a sale? Well, again, this comes to donation. There are some nonprofits who will come get those things. Um, and uh, again, you have to make those arrangements yourself or you can, if you have a move manager, they'll take care of it for you. <coughs> Questions or anything that we didn't cover because I'm filling in for Richard, so. <laughs> Yeah. I have an idea on your teddy bear uh -huh. thing. Uh, get a box mm -hmm. that says it right on top, favorite things to say. Okay, I think that's a good point. And, you know, mementos, uh, my, my son's uh, Pinewood Derby car is in my box. And we found out that if you, if you have dementia, that they sometimes will go through your box and that will calm you down. I bet, because those things you remember because they're buried further in your memory. Makes sense, yeah. I think each thing that you could make some notes to, put a notebook in and, and write, a, write the story down. You know, this is where this came from, because that's, and, and there are notebooks, you can get them on Amazon. Um, I can't remember the name of the one I bought, but I, I ordered one for my mother-in-law after mom passed, and it's literally all your passwords, um, everything, the key to your life, right? Um, so everything is in this book, and then at the back there's a place to write down some family stories. So um, any of that that you can do ahead of time for your kids and grandkids, I think that's, that's a huge gift to them. Because that's, mom had things pretty well organized, um, but there were things like, just, I just went through her wallet and found a doctor's appointment and called the hospital to cancel the doctor's appointment, and God bless her, she said, um, this cancels everything in our system, Karina. 
and I was like, oh, thank you. Because, you know, I'm still thinking, at least that's one thing, one box I could check. I was just so grateful that their system took care of that for me. Um, so those kinds of things, I mean, even if you write in the Social Security Administration phone number, because that was one of the first things I did was call and cancel mom's Social Security so that I didn't have to pay it back, right? Um, so even I had to look up that number, and it's a simple thing, but that book, if you write those things down, whoever your heirs are can take care of things so much more seamlessly. Did I see a hand? Yeah, um, my husband uh, worked with the aircraft industry and he did maintenance on all our cars. He has all these tools. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I would think those would hold quite a bit of value. I don't know. Um, just, I mean, most auctions I've been to, that's, or even yard sales, men will come and say, do you have tools? So it'd be a question. You could probably ask Richard about that, and he could give you some suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, it's like snap-on tools or craftsmen. Or yeah. And I'm sure, there's a, I'm sure there's a market for those. I just, you know, I haven't yeah. gone down that road. My brother had all my dad's tools, and we didn't deal with that with mom. Yeah. Hoy she had the... Hoy Auction is so good and so honest. Yeah. Just, Hoy's very good. Hoy Auction. Hoy Auction here in town. It's on Main Street. Um, Hoy, H-O-Y. They're um, on Main Street, just south of the, the lodge, mm -hmm. on that same side. It's something. It's kind of looks almost like it wise off there. They have a gorilla, don't they? It's before you get Isn't there a big statue there of a gorilla? Yeah. Oh, oh, they sold it. Okay. Well, there used to be a gorilla there. Right, little gas station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's he's very good. He's handled um, some of my clients' uh, estates before, um, and it part of what happens with him though is it depends on if he's busy. Because I I sent some people to him and they said he was full, and he couldn't get to us for six months. So. Before he closed down the in health auction during COVID, I think. And right. I think I think everything is online now. Okay. There he does because they they used because I used they used to, to do a physical auction. auction. Yeah, I used yeah. to. Yeah. I went to a couple of and they were packed. Yeah, <laughs> there is one out in like Spring Hope, and it's um, I think it's like one man's trash is another man's treasure. It's a long name, but I believe it's in Spring Hope. Um. And they've done uh, some, they've helped some of my clients before. I'd have to look it up and then I, it, if I Googled it, it'll pop up. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Do you happen to know if sterling silver ware is more valuable as is or melted down? I don't know. You know, I had some, some jewelry of mom's when, after she passed. I went into a place and I saw people bringing in silver. Um, so I would say that would be, there's, you know, the jewel recycle place. You could call one of those and just ask them the question and see what they have to say. Um, it's come, it's back where it's worth more because silver's worth more now. It's gone up in value. Um, so they'd be able to tell you what it's worth or I know they were paying people next to me as I was, you know, having the jewelry calculated. Um, they were, there was someone selling silver. And Bailey's and Cameron Village is another place. They are so honest and they'll let you know. And when I asked them a few years ago, they did tell me it's worth more whoever's going to buy it to melt it down. Okay. And okay. I raised uh, my mother's silver and I think it was uh, sterling. It was, I know it was sterling, but it was service for 16 and the serving pieces and it was $5,000 is all. Okay. So it's not much. Yeah, yeah. Not what, it, what people paid for it. Or what you would hope. Well, and so to that point, my parents, my mom still had the, the bed set that they bought in Houston in the 60s, which was now mid-century modern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was in pristine condition. She never would, she had, all of her other furniture she changed out, but for whatever reason she kept that same bedroom set. And we sold that for more than they paid for it. Of course, they, you know, this is numbers back in the day, but I think we paid that, we sold that for, this is again Midwest, $800 I think is what my brother got for it. So, and that was the bed, headboard, two dressers, a mirror, and a nightstand. Someone right, yeah, it was, they knew somebody in town who, um, so there's some things like that that, like I don't, mid-century modern is not my personal vibe, 
Um, so I, I just don't, it, I just don't, I don't know. It's just not my thing. Um, so I, I wouldn't have thought it had much value at all other than when my brother said, you know, and I said, fine, good, go, do. <laughs> So he, they actually, my brother and sister-in-law had her come out to the house and she bought that set and like they had her look at some other things and they kind of gave her a preview and she, she has a little shop or something. And my guess is she doubled the price and sold it somewhere online and, you know, I'm sure that's what she did. If anyone has any Dunbar furniture, do you know what Dunbar is? No. The UMB, it's worth a lot of money. It was, um, if you Google it, like my mom had all Dunbar, uh -huh. the Dunbar. The dining room table goes for a hundred thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so, you know, do, do your research if you have time or if you're working with a group, they're going to do the research for you. And so. a lot of these um, places that sell artwork, if you have a, um, like I called, I had some artwork that my mom had from the person that did the painting was very well known in Raleigh, and um, her paintings went for a lot of money. And they will, um, if they know, and they're signed and everything, and if they know anything about it, they will um, consign it for you yeah. um, and pay you a good amount. Okay. Good advice. Anybody else? Any burning questions we didn't answer? Well, any suggestions what to do with all this collectible, you know, the, the Dalton ladies, I think they were my mother's. I mean, I hate to throw them in the glass recycling. Right. I mean, or, or even even Waterford. I mean, I don't, you know, I think the option of nobody wants it, it goes in glass recycling, which sounds terrible. Um, the first thing I do, if you have something that has a name brand, the first thing I would do if you're, you know, other than asking like an expert or some people who deal in this all, every day, I would Google each piece and see if it pops up and there's some crazy value that's assigned to a specific thing because there might be one or two things that you have. Some may have no value at all and there might be one wild thing that it, there was only one printing, there was only one cut, you know what I mean? And that might have, yeah. Um, so if you, again, the, the, the gift of time is on your side. If you're starting this early and you're really not ready to do anything for a while, then take your time and look at some of those specific pieces. And, you know, in an afternoon, you probably could punch through a whole list of, of those things. Yeah. I mean, look at some of those, like those, those figurines. Mm -hmm. all, my mother was a collector. I'm not. But I have it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot of that is worth not much at all. You know, and and I I know she you know she probably spent you know a fortune on it honestly over time, um, but people don't want the curio cabinets. They don't want all that stuff. They don't want to dust it. You know, that's it's changed a lot. The lady my mom bought her house from, the last house she lived in, had an entire wall as big as the wall back here or this wall up front. It was a wall of built-ins she'd had done. And the whole thing was crammed with Longaberger baskets and cherished moments. Cherished moments, yeah. Precious moments, that's it. Yeah, thank you. I have some Hummels too, and I think some of those have value, but other, you know, I think again, it sort of depends which ones. Yeah, yeah, these were all glass front, and they had, each one had its, a little lock, and it was, we were told it was like $30,000 worth of precious moments that she had alone. Yeah. How do you spell that Dunbar furniture? How do you spell it? It's D U N B A R. Just real simple. I okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. so if you want to look, if it was made by Hickley, um, Hickley was, I think it's um, Hickey or Hickley was the designer. It's um, from like the 30s and 40s. No. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, question so, here. So are you saying we can contact uh, Richard at his email address yeah. with specific questions? Okay. Yeah, okay. I would ask him some questions and he He's can kind of... We in the seminar. And right. Okay. Yeah. He's, um, I've had clients work with him and then I've had clients who've worked with him before and then they're ready to make another move. And there's, there's nobody like his team. He's just fantastic. He's just, he's, he's respectful. He's kind. He's... Um, thoughtful. He's everything you need if you're, you know, if you need any kind of help with. 
and he's knowledgeable about where her deal with certain particular items or like the China. He would have more knowledge than I would because he deals with that on a daily basis. Like, I don't pack all of that up because I, you know, as a rule of thumb, I find the solution for the person who's going to come in and, you know, yeah, I, I pair them up with the move manager or with the liquidation, estate liquidator, whatever it is that's needed. Mm -hmm. If you want to feel good making a donation, I think the green chair does a wonderful job. So let's say you do have Hinkley or Waterford or whatever, and you donate it to them. It's not given directly to people who've been homeless for whatever reason, but they do, like three or four times a year, invite people like us to purchase those items if you're still into buying Waterford or Sterling or whatever. And the proceeds of that then go toward them helping people who've been homeless. So it's a feel-good thing for sure. I have a friend that lives downtown. She works there once a week, volunteers, and she can't say enough good things about green chair. It started with a green chair. It started... It started yeah, yeah. Yeah. The green chair. It's an odd name, but it's easy to remember. Green chair. Mm -hmm. Green chair. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so if I, did we cover everybody's questions? Yes. Just a suggestion if you're trying to establish value on something, take a look at eBay too. True. Because uh, not what people are asking for stuff, but to actually see what things are being sold for. Yeah, that's a good point because they may ask ten thousand dollars and it's worth a hundred. But yes, it's true. I mean, you know, there are people on there who will ask just to see. They toss it out there. Yes, perceived value. Yeah. Or they may not even do their research. Maybe they just assign the value and that's what they think it's worth. But it's only worth what the market will bear, right? Same as a house. <laughs> I have those conversations on a daily basis. <laughs> it's only people are only going to pay what they're going to pay. So, okay. So thank you all. Yeah, one more. The manager, the, if you use the manager, Richard Miller, he will sell your house to... No, Richard does not. He's not a real... I'm a realtor, so I would work in tandem or any realtor that you choose with any move manager. Yeah. But he still gets a percentage of the sale. I just use it as an example of, yeah, about what it would cost you. It, okay. Yeah, if you have an entire household full of contents, then it's going to be... You can figure it, you know, at a percentage of up to about 6%. And some will be higher. I know he's, he had one that that the lady was truly a hoarder um, and it was a big house like a lot of square footage and I think he said his it was like forty seven thousand dollars is what he charged but they were there for weeks I mean you know it's a whole team yeah so it, it's not gonna be like that for your house unless you're that person um, <laughs> and, he, and he can do like I just had one where we had a townhome that the gentleman had passed away um, and he had that cleared out, and it was 1,700 square feet. I think the cost was like $6,000. Um, and he, he literally told me he would have it ready on a Tuesday. He actually was done with it on Monday. And I came in, and I had it listed by Friday. Wow. I had pictures done. I had it, I mean, everything was ready to go by Friday. So, and we had it under contract by Sunday, Saturday, actually. So, um, so he, that's what they work, you know, we work very closely. He tells me when I have it back. And then I go in and get it ready and, and get it on the market. Question, do you have any experience with a place for mom? Are they good, bad, so, so a place for mom, they're very nice people. Um, so the way that works, um, if you call them, they're only going to give you options of senior communities that pay them a kickback. So you won't see the full picture. That's the one concern I always have with the, those placement agencies is that they, they, they only show those places. Um, and usually they're very nice places, um, but that may not be the complete menu. And there might be something else that better fits your budget um, or has more amenities or is closer to home or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's one of the reasons why I try to tour a lot of them. And I'll t I mean, I've toured with clients, so I'll go in and tour. And, um, and I don't discriminate. I, to me, it's just whatever fits best for you. Yeah, Sandy? We, I had a terrible... Did you? Uh -oh. oh, God. They were awful. With your mom? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It was... 
They sent us to Sunrise. Oh my God. And that place is a terrible. You know, and I, I have not been in Sunrise lately. Um, the thing that, that happens with some of these communities, you might have one that has a bad reputation. Somebody says, oh, that place was terrible. And the whole, all of their, you know, admin has changed. All of their, all of their um, people that work there, all their employees. So sometimes they can go from good to bad or bad to good. Yeah, um, they can do it happen overnight. Yeah. That's right. Anything, yeah. if you ever do tour a place, pers just if you go and tour, what I will tell you is I always get there early. And by early, I mean almost 30 minutes. And then I say, oh, you know, I'm running early. And I, you know, I just kind of, you know, like I'm a jerk. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to take up your time. I'll just sit out here in the lobby. And then I wait for people to come sit and I ask them questions. That's why I'm there. Now, if I go with, uh, with clients who are going to sell their house and they're looking at communities, I always book right before lunch and I make them serve a meal. Because the food is super important if you're going to go to a senior community. You're going to live with that food every day of the week. And you want to make sure it's something you can that stomach. That can change overnight also. That can change overnight. You're exactly right. <laughs> it can. However, here's the good news about that. The, if it changes overnight and there are staff changes for some reason, most of those you're in there month to month. So you can always go somewhere else. And you're you don't have that many belongings, so it's fairly easy to pick up and move. Um, and most of those places don't want to lose you, and they'll have forums. So a lot of them have... Um, groups or clubs that you can join. Most of them have a chef who will come out on a either weekly or monthly basis and have conversations with you about what you do and don't like. Um, and the, the meeting that we just had where we talked about independent living and Beth was here, Beth Holden from Springmore, mentioned the cornbread uprising. I did that on purpose and I know she was like, Karina, <laughs> she's probably thinking that because she told me that. But here's the reason why I think that's important. It's not, it's, the big point isn't that they had a cornbread uprising and everybody started all of a sudden complaining about the cornbread. The point is <laughs> that the retirement community listened and they had a whole, it, they made it a game, really. They made it fun. They had all these recipes and they let everybody vote and then everybody got to decide what cornbread they wanted. They also had a coffee uprising, by the way, which I didn't mention. The coffee uprising, they were serving Starbucks. Well, this is a continuing care retirement community. I mean, it costs some money to get in there, right? And so Starbucks is, a, for a lot of people, kind of a nice coffee. But a lot of people who live there have been raised on Folgers. So the uprising was it didn't taste right to them. It was too strong. <laughs> so they now have one urn that has Starbucks and another with Folgers. <laughs> so it's, it, you, it, that's the other thing is to listen for how do they, how do they respond. Yeah, how do they pivot and respond when you have complaints as residents? Because the last thing you want to do is bounce around from one to the next. But um, I, when I have, when I schedule the lunch, I also will ask, do you have an ambassador or somebody that from the community who could have lunch with us? And then I'll sit and ask all the, you know, the, the, you know obviously the clients do too, but um, I ask, what's the worst thing? Because they're going to tell you all the great things about it. I'm like, what's the worst thing about living here? Because we want to see the good, bad, and the ugly, right? I was told to always show up without an appointment and just walk around and ask because um, when my mother needed a place, I went to every single place in the area. I mean, every place. Uh -huh. Within Cary, Raleigh, and um, you also want to look up um, the problem with Sunrise, they had so many complaints, they're called deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And if you look up North Carolina, Wake County has a, a list and they give you the ratings. And when they say deficiencies, that means they're complaints against the facility. I think that's because it's licensed though. That's for nursing homes. That's, right? So anything that's li anything licensure, so it would start with assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing, but it won't happen with independent living. Independent living is essentially a cruise ship on land. Right. It is. Which, which government agency runs that website? Do you know uh, I think it's is? Department of Health, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Is, it, wait, I think. is it county or is it state? It's state. Each state's licensure is different than other states. Yes. But um, Sunrise had so many complaints against them. Their parent company at the time is in Texas. 
and what they did, and it's a big company, what they did to get rid of the complaints, they sold it to one of their subsidiaries. Oh. That wipes out all the complaints. And because I, DH, I would, DHS even stopped responding to my phone calls because we had so many problems. They stole my mother's diabetes medicine. They stole her Depends. They stole her regular meds. They gave them to other people, which is a, a felony. Mm. And then they started, and you need to check your bills because they will charge you for stuff that's not there. And I remember one time I had to take my mom to the hospital, and when I came home, they were in her room stealing her Depends. And I said, what are you doing? They said, oh, someone else needs your Depends. I said, that's where all her Depends have been going. Because I would put them up on the top shelf, and I'd go in the next day, and they were all gone. And I said, no wonder my mother goes through a pack of Depends every day. And I would go in there, and there were things, they put things in the room and said, we didn't get the, you know, I didn't order this, you need to take it off the bill. So you have to be careful. It got so bad. Um, and then I found out they were get, feeding her the wrong food because you can get, um, asked for a certain diet. And we also had the problem, what's the adult center that's right across from Lytle's? Danger. The lodge. The lodge. Yeah, the lodge. We, I moved her, finally moved her to the lodge and hired my own people to come in and I was going in every day. But um, the, we had a problem at the lodge too because if your parent or you goes there and you have a special meal, you have to, you know, special diet, you have to look at what they're doing. I mean, they were feeding my mom at Sunrise fried chicken and all this stuff, and she couldn't eat all that. She's not supposed to eat all that. And so I was, and then DHS was out there all the time. I mean, I even saw, if they didn't answer the call button in time, the guy died. I, while I was, my mom was there, I saw several people die because the call button wasn't answered in time. And another time, um, I tried to get in, because um, my mom had called me and I couldn't get in touch with her, so I went over there at night. They had what's the, the what's that flu that the virus? Oh, the, the RSV. The, the current RSV, the one. No, um, this was the okay. Okay. Oh. No, bird flu. No, norovirus. Norovirus. Um, yeah, and it's a food. It's they, a mm. gastrointestinal problem. They had not, um, they had closed down the facility and they wouldn't come to the door. And finally when I did, I mean, I waited like till like two o'clock in the morning to get in and I was pounding on the door and calling and no one was answering it. I was the one that reported it to DHS because by law they are supposed to report it because it's so um, bad and DHS had to go out there and tell them. My neighbor, I just talked to her and she has um, her mother-in-law's in Sunrise and I, she said good things about it so it sounded like you know now the staff and all of that may have changed their policies may have changed that's why it's important to yeah, I was there. To go, go check it all out, and if you know, if possible, have someone nearby who can advocate for you. If you get to the point where you're really not doing the greatest job at, at advocating for yourself, um, if that's possible, and there are actually people who, if you don't have any heirs uh, and you, you know, live on your own or know someone who does, there are people that you can hire that will take care of all your end of life. They'll take care of things as your power of attorney. They'll take care of things at, at end of life and, and honor all of your wishes. So um, I don't have any of the information on them, but I know the CCRCs, um, they were, when I first started touring those, I was told that those people existed, didn't know it. Um, so you can find people who will advocate for you. Uh, you, didn't have to get, you don't know how to get in touch with them? No, I mean, I can t I'll check with Beth, and if you send me a message to remind me, I'll make sure I'll get the information from Beth. She has it at Springmore. I'm sure they all do, but. No, is Springmore a good place? Springmore's, yeah, it's great. It's a nonprofit. Um, it's one of the more affordable. Um, it's also older. It's it's 39 years old. Um, if you like the feeling, uh, a feeling of being kind of 
in a neighborhood, that's one of the best places to be, I think, because it's, it sprawls, um, it's that campuses, you know, because it's 39 acres. Now, um, they don't have all the bells and whistles that some of these new ones do with, you know, as, as far as brand new, fancy, whatever. I have a sister-in-law who's in early dementia and lives in Chicago and I have to move her here. Okay. This is where I live. And um, so I'm now educating myself. I'm new to Raleigh. Okay. I have, so, I've had two friends that have had a whole family members at Springmore. Springmore, the one thing that about a CCRC, you'll have to check with them and see what their policy is on allowing someone to come in. A lot of them um, require you to come in independent and then you can go through the other. Um, and so it depends. I know that they have um, some exceptions at Springmore because um, we've had those conversations before. So I do think they at least would be one to call if, if you were looking at a CCRC um, versus a, you know a freestanding community that's going to be just simply memory care. There's also um, a place in Cary, um, Templeton. Templeton's one, yeah. What? Templeton is one no, in Cary. No, it's an old one. It's been there for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't think of it. You're talking, you're CCRC or just in, in a... It, what, it's, it's like an, you go in as, you know, they have independent. independent and um, you get, you get Searstone is one. Um, I'm sorry. Brookdale. Brookdale. No, it, I think it started with the W. Um, oh, Walton Wood. Walton Wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Walton, Walton Wood. They're supposed to be. Um, I had some friends. They are. They're there. kind of expensive. The gentleman who was here last month that did that talked about the VA. Um, yeah. He actually told me he had a, a couple that were clients that um, they're paying for assisted living both. Fourteen thousand dollars is the cost for the two of them to be there per month. Whoa. So they're, they're a little on the expensive side. He was asking me if I knew of any, after we had the session last month, yeah, he said, do you know of any that are less expensive? A friend of mine's mother went there, and then the daughter went there as well. Mm -hmm. and she, and Another idea, you know, when, if you have a loved one in a retirement home, be sure to lock up their medicine. Because there, there have been cases where people steal yeah, she drugs just, she from yeah. Well, and so one of the thing, one of the solutions can be, and it depends on if she has dementia. I mean, it depends on how far gone she is. If she's a wanderer, then they won't let her into any any place that's independent. Right. Um, right. But but if she's not a wanderer, um, it could be she'd qualify to go into a place and just have some help, and that's a lot less expensive. Um, one of them that leans heavily into the assisted living space. Um, and would have helpers there is the Cambridge. So you have the Cambridge at Briar Creek, you have one in Wilmington, and you have one down in Apex. And they actually have like a whole deck that they'll bring out that's a menu of other health um, uh, options that they offer. And so one will be so much a month, and the next one will be so much more a month, and it has to do with how many days a week they go and what they do for you. Um, and really, they're kind of on that farther out edge of like providing uh, almost assisted living without having assisted living because of the licensure and because it's hard to get into assisted living and then the price tag goes up so much, sometimes you're better off to go in independent and have help. Okay. And the help that you get, and, and it, you can ask a lot of questions about that, but the help that you get um, can start in as little as 15 minute increments in an independent living community. Whereas if you were in your home with a driveway and a garage and all that, they're gonna charge you a minimum of four hours. And that's because they charge per door. But when they're in one big community, they've got 120 doors to go to, so they can charge 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And they just go in and help. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yes. So it actually saves you money to go into independent living. It's one of the unknown kind of tips I would give, mm -hmm. um, is that you can save money by going into independent living versus having to stay at home. Because staying at home and having home health care can cost, on average, ninety to one hundred twenty thousand per person per year. Whoa! Right. <laughs> there goes your savings. There goes your savings. Fast, yeah. fast. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what I did. When or your equity in your house. When we left Sunrise, um, the coach, it was we ended up with a lawsuit with them. That's how bad it was. Yeah. Um, and um, I went to. The lodge, however, the lodge wasn't built then, so 
they didn't open they, when they were supposed to. They were six months late. So I was driving every day to Durham and back, and Durham and back, sometimes three or four times a day when my mother had a doctor's appointment, which really pissed me off. But when um, I hired people to go in, even though I was going every day, I hired someone to go in in the morning, help her get dressed, give her a bath, give her her meds, and then I would come in, and then they would come in later in the afternoon and, you know, give her her meds for the evening, um, everything. So, and that was a lot cheaper. That was, that saved us probably three or $4,000 a month. Where was your mom at? She was at Sunrise. Well, where was she in Durham? Is that the question? It was yeah. the Lodge in Durham. The Lodge in Durham, okay. But we, it, the one in Wake Forest wasn't built yet. So when that got built, because we, we went to the opening of the Lodge when it was being built, and we, we wanted to move there. And they were supposed to open within like two months, a month or two months, and mm -hmm. it got delayed like six months. But then we moved her back. Because I live in Wake Forest, so it was just right around the corner for me to go everywhere. Are you happy with the one in Wake Forest? Well, she's no longer there, but oh. we were, um, I was fairly happy with it. They have a lot to do, and she enjoyed it because they have a lot to do. And they I do. used to go over every day with well, my what's dog. What's the name of that one? Pardon? The Lodge? Oh, it's oh. it's right at 98 and Main Street. Yeah, it's just it's south of us. Across from Lytles. And it's Lytles called the Lodge? Off of Main Street. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I mean, they, I had her do, you know, they gave her a special diet, you know, because I had to give them a special diet. And they do snacks, and they would have things to do for them in the evening. In fact, this place was, before this place was built, they had their office at the lodge for a long time on the top floor. But they have a lot of things to do there for seniors. Do they have memory care also? No. They don't. It's just assisted living. It's independent living. It's just independent. Yeah. yeah, but they do have um, people who will come in for the 15 minute thing or th however long someone needs, uh, which most of those do. They have garages back behind, um, and they have that's it's there. I think their chef comes out every week and talks to the residents, if yeah, I remember right from there. There's a lot of places do um, have doctors that make house calls, some have doctors in house. Um, the Cambridge that I was discussing in Briar Creek and Apex, that doctor is hired and paid for by. Um, the, by Cambridge, and um, he's three days at one of the communities and two days at the other. Springboard does too. They have an in-house. Oh, they have a whole medical team, yeah, because they're CCRC, yeah. A question. Um, we have a friend who's uh, got dementia. Uh, she thinks she has, is in control of her medicine. Mm -hmm. She needs, she really needs to have power of attorney, medical power of attorney. Mm -hmm. Is there any agency or group that we can go to to help us figure out a way to get her power, medical power of attorney, uh, I guess, against her will? Well, her doctor, you're, you need a lawyer to do both. I mean, yeah. I have power of attorney. My husband and I each have for each other. It, the lawyer does both. It does power, depending on the state. The rules vary by state. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but you have power of attorney for health care. And sometimes that's separate for power of attorney for finances. Sometimes it's together. In California, it's together. Uh, and it has to be written by a really good lawyer. Because I found that I was, my mother was in California. I was in South Dakota. Um, the lawyer in California I had was fabulous. She was so good. That power of attorney thing was you know, an inch thick. And when I went to take over finances, a lot of the banks refuse to recognize financial power of attorneys and they just they send it to the bank and the bank sends it back and says this is no good we don't work with this and it's because of the way it was written by the particular cheap $500 lawyer huh. and the banks I mean seriously B of A gave me nothing but grief uh, Wells Fargo gave me nothing but grief hmm. but eventually I persisted and so I did took financial power, but it's the same person that does this. The thing about you need to have that done before she gets to a point where it's too far. That's but she's in right. A, a assisted living, or no, a, um, 
what's the one where the 24 hour nursing? Skilled nursing. Skilled, she's in skilled nursing. The clock is ticking. They're going to kick her out, uh, I would guess, in, within the next three, four weeks. Uh, she she needs medical power of attorney and she needs financial power of attorney. Would you be taking it? Is that what you're saying? But she still has she still has mental capabilities. So I so get her no, to a lawyer. Yeah, get her now. to a lawyer. Get a lawyer to go there. As long as she understands what the lawyer is saying to her, the lawyer will query her. But she goes questions. crazy when you mention power of attorney. For a you lawyer. don't use those words. Just send the lawyer in and let the lawyer do that part. Tell her it's somebody who's going to help her and take care of her when she and, and when she gets bad. It's you know, the when she needs help. Witness that have to document that. Yeah. And then you can take it, you know, if you're the person that you want to have it designated to do that. But you need a lawyer and you need the lawyer now because the laws change with different states. And um, you can't if, make her a ward of the state or a guy, you know, get a helper or somehow. Well, you need a lawyer. Yeah. You really need a lawyer. No, these other people have no power to legally, they have no power. Yeah. And you need somebody because the court might, somebody in the, you may find a relative that's going to challenge that, or the state might challenge that. So you need a lawyer. And there okay. are lawyers that do that. A couple more questions over here. I was just going to say, the Department of Social Services might be able to help. There's an open problem, though, about getting um, like guardians for adult services. That's kind of a... That can be... Guardian. Guardian. Mm -hmm. yeah, guardian. 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 But you can have it for adults too, but you need a judge. Then you end up with judges right. and courts, mm -hmm. yeah. and you have to go to court to document. Be, that can be complicated, but if there's somebody who really is not capable of caring for themselves, sometimes social services can help with that. You have to be careful, though. I mean, I almost hesitate to say that. But, um, you know, they can be made, quote, like a ward of the court kind of a thing where they, they she has no family. She does. Well, yeah, but, but she's, she's uh, you know, at her wits end to what to do. Anyway. Well, uh, the way I would pose it is, if you if you decide, dis making no decision is a decision, okay? Deciding to do nothing is a decision. And so if she ignores this, then she will be in the absolute worst, worst position she possible. So this is allowing her the control that she wants. She just thinks she, by putting it off that she's in control. And the problem is there will be a point where she will completely lose control. And then it's going to be the worst case scenario. She's not right mentally. She's it's hard. It's hard to have. I, you know, my mom and I had some conversations. It's a long story, but it, I had a conversation with a counselor about it because she'd always been very logical. And, um, and she was not being logical. And so I thought I was. So when I talked to the counselor, he said, well, at 80, the frontal lobe starts to decline, and that is that is logic. And so I thought I had this very logical conversation with my used to be logical mother about the fact that she's not being logical because A, she's now 80, and B, she's on chemo, which also affects the frontal lobe. And it went right over here. So I don't know if you'll have any luck or not, um, but it's worth trying. Um, and and for, you know, for me, what I one of the things that finally happened was I just said, Mom you know, we're, we're up against the wall and we need to do this. And she finally said, okay. But I'd, it'd taken me years to get where we got. One last. I know you've been back here waiting patiently. Well, I have two. First of all, this is driving me crazy. At 80, we are going to lose our yes. It starts to decline. It starts to decline. <laughs> Which is why you plan now, why you make decisions now. It really is. It's at, 50, at 50, the age of 50, you need double the light to read. That's another what sad the, statistic. What the doctor said, yeah, your frontal lobe cortex is your manager, your brain manager, and it is deteriorating. What the doctors say for people like us, I'm 76, what they say is do one task at a time only. In order to really have control over what you're doing, focus only on one task. If you're cooking, only cook. If you're reading, only read. Do not multitask anymore because you can't. You really are not effectively multitasking. If you're driving, just drive. Do not listen to the radio. Do not listen. No, forget the texting. But the point is, you can control your life a great deal if you just focus on what you're doing and not try to do what you did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. When you were multitasking. Except that the parameters are different. Yeah. 
And then my other question. Like okay. This is calling something a CCR, some initial. Oh, CCRC is a Continuing Care Retirement Community. So and you go independent and then it takes you all the way. They promise to care for you for life. And they also sometimes are referred to as life care communities. Um, you're going to pay a, a substantial down payment. It's usually half a million or more to, to, to get in. And now, you can negotiate that to go back to your heirs, depending on how long you live. So you can, depending on the conversation you have whenever you go there. And then you pay monthly rent. So you start out independent, and then you cycle through whatever you need within that community. They have everything on campus, whether that's a high rise or several acres. One needs more care than the other. Then you pay for both. The, but the one can, goes on to right. the, the different things. And yeah. So let's say there's one couple I met at Springmore that they'd moved there about 10 years ago. And he, his wife, this particular couple, his wife had Alzheimer's, um, had been diagnosed were with, uh, with dementia at the time, and it, it became Alzheimer's. Um, and he, they had a very good um, couple friend that had the same situation. And so the difference was... They moved into the CCRC, and the couple moved. Um, they did all. The man did all kinds of renovations to their house to prepare, and thought he was doing the right thing. And he said, "Now it's been ten years. She's in full blown. Both of them are in full blown Alzheimer's." And the one man who had renovated his house completely regretted it because he didn't have the support he needed. Um, and now they couldn't get into a community like that because she's already has Alzheimer's, so it's too late. And in, in this case, the couple that moved to Springmore, they made friends. So he had 10 years of building friendships, and he has all of the support in that community that he's building these last 10 years. So his wife has now gotten to the point where she's in the Alzheimer's unit or in the memory care unit, and he goes and sees her every day. But he does all kinds of social things with all of his friends that he's been there all this time. Now, they, they spend money on both. I mean, there's money spent on the memory care for her and on the... He moved to a smaller apartment in his case when she moved out, um, which saved a little money. But um, but that's that was their plan. There's also a good place that another friend of mine had their mom. It's also Fairview, right? you know, which is a big place. I'm trying to think of what is off Fairview. Um, Downtown. Um, it's right um, in the where all those churches are on Fairview. There's one down there that I cannot think of the name, and I've been there. It's a it's a big place. Um, I think it got it got went out probably about I don't know maybe about ten years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been there. It's an older building, but a friend of mine had her mother there. Get her mother had dementia, mm -hmm. and Disappointed on how she treated her little brother that was um, not was mentally. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. She turned him over to the ward of the state. Oh. She got tired of caring, caring for him. Her. Yeah. He was living on the street. Yeah. And she didn't do anything. But her, and she wouldn't go see her mom. And I had, I had grown up with the, the family because we used to ride horses together. But, um, okay, she never went to see her mother that much. But apparently she was very well taken care of at the little place that's off of fear. Thank you. Um, so, a couple last things. If you would, you all, you should each have a survey there. There might be a couple of you came in at the last that didn't, but um, if you would please fill out the survey. Um, and the schedule for next month is Tuesday, Thursday, December 14th, 10.30, and that's the truth about home and in-home, um, home health and in-home personal care. It's not going to move for me. On your seat, you should have a postcard. If you don't, please pick one up if you want one. This is the last month of the this year, and then we'll start with the new series um, or the new, you know, new subjects next year. So um, those will start in January, um, and I think the January one is leaving a legacy. No, living to be a hundred is, is the January. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you all so much for coming and for all your input. If you want Richard's um, information, he's got his flyers here. Appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.
If you would like um, a newsletter, I have a monthly newsletter that I mail out. You can just indicate that on your survey. And if you want a copy of this month's, they're up here on the, in, some of you are on the mailing list. Question. Uh huh. Um, you were going to send some information to someone like, behind me uh -huh. about um, solo agents who don't have anybody to serve or have somebody who might die right. for them. Right. And so, um, how, how do I get the email? Did you fill out the survey? Not yet, but I. You can email me if you want. 